it seems impossible. It seemed impossible for Isaiah in the first reading. He was a priest who eventually becomes a prophet. He worked under the authority of four kings of Jerusalem and the poor kings of, of Israel just, just never made it. They were never successful, saintly people representing the covenant of God with the people. So that's why Isaiah had a lot of work to do in his 40 years as a priest and then as a prophet. How he became a prophet seems unbelievable. He was praying one day in the sanctuary and he had a vision. The vision of heaven, angels singing and smoke filling the place. And God said in this vision, go, go, go preach, shake them up, shake up the troops because they're making a mess of my people. And it seemed impossible. Isaiah says, me? I, I, I'm a man of unclean lips which didn't mean he had a dirty mouth. It meant that he was not worthy. I, I can't preach. I'm just another guy and probably just as bad as the rest of them. But God chose him. It seemed impossible. And when he was convinced that God did send him, he said, here I am, send me. And then his ministry began as a great prophet. And we use the the writings of the prophet Isaiah and his successors still in that same school of thought for many chapters of the books of Isaiah and throughout the year because it was so significant always calling the people back to God calling them back to what they're supposed to be doing not pretending it must have seemed impossible as as Paul is riding his horse going to Damascus with paperwork in his hands that allowed him to drag anybody who was following this, this weird way of the Christ, to drag them out, bring them to Jerusalem, and condemn them. They're following a pagan god or some radical idea. And Paul was a good Pharisee. He was determined. He was going to do his job. And it seemed impossible when he was thrown off the horse on his way to Damascus and the great light, as he himself says today in the book of Corinthians, his letter, I was thrown off my horse and, and out of the light, a voice. Again, he must have said, this is, this is impossible, this is not happening. And it did happen. And out of the light, the voice of Jesus came, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, I, I don't even know who you are. What do you mean persecuting you? And the voice says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And then the understanding begins in his theology. The understanding that the body of Christ who is being persecuted is here. We, people who are baptized into Jesus are members of the body of Christ. We've never lost that great theology. That's rooted in our faith. And to reiterate it, Paul gives us the earliest understanding of our faith as Christians. It's called the kerygma. And if you didn't hear it all, you heard it read very well. Just refer back to your, your missiles and, and your scriptures. In which he says that what I'm passing on to you when he starts preaching is what Jesus taught me. And he called me as one of the apostles. Well, not really as an apostle, as, as an aberration, basically, he says. Because I wasn't one of the twelve. I was persecuting him. I was getting rid of those Christians who are loving people, giving food to the hungry, clothing the naked. What, what are you kidding me? I'm, I'm getting rid of all those. We go back to good old Judaism. But because of Jesus, I've changed. It almost seems impossible. And he starts preaching what we believe 
the charisma, the foundation of our faith, that Jesus rose from the dead and is with us. The most important aspect of our faith. Without Jesus' resurrection, we're just a bunch of people gathering together and making noise. But because of the resurrection, Jesus, who is living, speaks to every one of us in our own ways. Definitely in our own languages, because he speaks to the heart of each one of us. It must have seemed impossible for Peter, James, John, as they're going about their fishing, how exhausted they must have been. Peter says, we were at it all night. They used to wake up like 3 o'clock in the morning and fish until dawn and then take the, the, the winnings of their nets, go to the market so they were still fresh when they're selling their fish at the marketplace by 8 o'clock when people came shopping. But this night we caught nothing. And they were exhausted. And Peter sees Jesus in the crowd following Jesus. And it seems so normal. Let me step into your boat so I can reach more people. You can pull out a little further and my voice will reach more people. And Peter says, what? why not? The boat's empty. I've caught nothing. Might as well sit here and listen to you. See how Jesus speaks to us when we don't expect him. Jesus gets to us when we are least prepared. Why? Because he's always there. It's up to us to catch him because he's always there for us. So, Jesus preaches. The crowds are happy about that. And then Jesus says something very silly. He, he, I say silly because he's a carpenter by trade. He's a teacher by avocation. He's got a nice following. He did a few miracles that we know of. But he's not a fisherman. He doesn't know anything about fishing. Like me, I know nothing about fishing. When I was a child, we would go to Union Beach, New Jersey, and go to the bridge between Keyport and Union Beach and fish with my father once a month because that's when the high tide came in and he was there on that weekend. And we'd lower these nets, square boxes, into the water. And the water was, <laughs> it wasn't clear at all. I am looking for something to compare it to. It was dark water. And we'd catch crabs. Sometimes we'd catch crabs. Boring? I couldn't believe anything could be so boring. Waiting for the, the net to move a little bit so you could pull up this crab. Sometimes they were like this big. Sometimes they were big. The baby, the Jersey Blues, they used to call them. So fishing is not, you know, if, if you do it for an occupation, it's really important. But it's not the, I don't think, it's the most exciting experience in the world. I'd rather preach than fish. So Jesus says something silly to Peter. Go out a little further with your boat. You heard it. You just said it. And Luke has is, Luke is given us this rendition, because you hear this in many of the Gospels. But the way Luke posits this particular miracle, Jesus has already gathered fishermen. He's already gathered followers. He's popular. And he says, pull out. Goes out. And Jesus says, now put your net in the water. Now, please, please. We used to put pieces of chicken inside the net. We used to, if my mother had leftover coal cuts, we'd bring them to the, to the bridge and put them inside the net just to catch these fish, these uh, crabs. I was always lucky at the end of the day, my father would say, um, let's go to Keyport and buy a dozen crabs. And I thank God. <laughs> Our fishing experience would be over and we'd be bringing clean crabs to home for mom to cook. So that I understood. But Peter's saying, y y you're not a fisherman. Okay, guys, throw the nets over. Show this carpenter what a carpenter does and show this carpenter what fishermen do. And we've been at it all night and we've caught nothing. Now, d d this, d don't regard this as a story about Jesus and the fishermen and the apostles. This is us. This is the living word of God. 
And it seems impossible. How does God hit you and me? How does God touch us? How, do, how does he reveal himself to us when we least want to hear from him? How does he reveal himself to us when we're going through uh, difficult moments, whether it's physical or psychological ailments? How does God reach out to us when our family and friends disappoint us and aggravate us, or they themselves are sick? How does God reach out to us? He's there. It's up, us to, up to us to grab hold of him and bring him into the situation because he's already there and he knows we need him. Like the fisherman at that point didn't know what was going on fully, but this was recorded because the whole revelation came out very clearly. So they hail the nets into the water. So many fish, like the Jews would say, oy vey, they didn't know what to do with them. The nets were bursting. They called their buddies, come over, help us with all these fish. Both boats were filled with sinking. It seemed impossible. And what does Peter do? He gets on his hands and knees and says, whoa, get away from me, God. Get away from me. You are too much for me. I am unworthy. I'm like a only because of the occupation. A dirty fisherman. Dirty feet. I smell like fish. Uh, and you're holy. There's something about you that's really outstanding. And it's impossible that you, God, would come to me. <laughs> Relax, Peter, Jesus says. From now on, you're going to be fishing for men and women. From now on, the people I am speaking to right now whether it's through internet or here in person, will be part of the net or the bark, the ship of Peter. From now on, Peter, what you will be fishing for are people. And you will be sharing with them the message reiterated by Paul a few seconds ago that Christ rose from the dead, is with us, reveals himself to us, healed people, and asks us to imitate him. It seemed impossible, but you know what happens. Things in our lives, when, when, when we're least expecting them, if we open our eyes and greet the mysteries of life with awe, just let God do his thing. You'll be surprised how he reveals himself to us. Every one of us has a personal story. Every one of us can think back. I mean, spend time in prayer and reflection. Think back. How did I get to know God? Because it's almost impossible for me to be here in this church praying to God. God, praying to God and Jesus Christ, me, a nobody, praying to God and speaking to God and presuming that God listens to me. That's almost impossible. Well, nothing is impossible to God. And he experienced life so that we can experience his divinity. He came and walked on this earth so we would know what it would be like to be with him forever. Not, not when we're dead, now. To be with him by loving, by serving, by respecting. And it's no great shakes to be a Christian. Guaranteed. It's right from the beginning. See what's behind me above the altar? It's not a pretty picture. Oh, we clean it up. We clean the crucifixion up. We make them look very nice. We just as closing, he's, he's nice and there's no spit on him, there's no blood, there's no dirt from the streets on him. But to be a Christian is to offer ourselves to one another. And it hurts. The ultimate reward is resurrection and life eternal. But in the meantime, it hurts. And you know that as well as I do. It hurts to be humble. It hurts to apologize. It hurts to put someone else first. It feels so great to be someone 
who has artificial power that make people fear. And you know that. Just, just recently in our subways here in town, someone throws a microwave on the subway rails. Sure, that person had power, the power of destruction and the power of evil. Someone later throws a burning shopping cart right into one of the cars of the subway. See, that's what's easy to do. To be part of the world according to Satan, that's easy to do. Hey, be prejudiced. Take advantage of each other. Walk on top of each other. Get ahead, steal, make as much money as you want. That's easy to do. The cross is not easy. The quality of life living as a Christian, it's almost impossible, but it's not. Because of Jesus. Each time we come to the Eucharist, we are challenged. Yeah, to say amen when we receive the Eucharist, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing, yes. But we're not saying, yeah, okay, give me the body of Christ. We're saying, yes! This is the body of Christ, and I absolutely believe it. That's almost impossible without faith. And that's why we're here. He called every one of us, wherever we came from this morning, the comfort of our beds, a pleasant ride, a cold walk, wherever we came from, Whatever burdens we're bringing with us, praying for our parents, praying for our friends, praying for those who are ill, praying for our special intentions, all of that we bring now. It's almost impossible that God would pay attention to us, but it's not because Jesus is with us.